Welcome to Pretty Lies and Alibis. Join us as we seek the truth and travel the long road to justice. Hi, alibiers. Welcome to another episode of Pretty Lies and Alibis. I'm Gigi Fruit Loop. What you know? Did you know that a tarantula can survive two years without food? They can actually go much longer without food than compared to water. So as long as there is water available, a tarantula will not suffer any bad side effects from starvation. And I actually know that's true because I have a friend of mine who lost one in his Jeep for three months. Oh. Could not find it. The tarantula didn't have any water or anything, and he found it three months later alive and fine. Uh-uh. Nope, nope, in the, nope. In the, in the Jeep. Uh-uh. Yep. Yep. Nope. See, if that thing would have come crawling up my leg. <laughs> it's a home alone moment. Yeah. Yeah. So for the very last time, we want to give a shout out to one of our sponsors, Two Cool T-Shirt Quilts. You can go to twocooltshirtquilts.com slash pretty lies and alibis. We've done a year with Andrea and Two Cool T-Shirt Quilts. We're grateful for their support for this whole year. Yeah, it, she took a chance. She did. And um, it's been great for us. It's been, she's got some orders. It was a mutual thing. And so we just want to, just from the bottom of our hearts, uh, thank Andrea um, from day one up there in Asheville having dinner with uh, her and her husband and me and my girls. Just a beautiful person. And we really do appreciate you. Yep. So uh, in, in the future, if you need a t-shirt quilt, please go see Andrea. And please know, I, I told her, I shot her an email, but I told her I still will refer people to her because. She oh, for sure. I'm going to get. Yeah, I'm going to get my uncle uh, a, a quilt made of my aunt shirts and for sure. Yeah. yeah. So anyways, uh, we are going to pick back up on these blogs. I think we maybe have two or three to go and then we're back into the timeline. So we're going to pick up on September 4th, 2015. Chad, the title of this blog, don't forget about me. So it says, soon after Tammy and I were married, she accepted a full-time secretarial position with Springville City. By the way, last night, Fruit Loop, we totally butchered names, and everybody yeah. told us, but um, sorry, y'all. Manta, I got it. I got no, it. No, I think it was some names of um, the, you know, we were saying Jimenez, it's like the hit, it, it's like H. Yeah. It, so, it is. Yeah. It's, and I know that, like, yeah. H is, is, you know what I mean? Yeah, so um, we yeah. just, we're Southern, and we see it, we say it like we see it. Well, the Mormon word we messed up, we said Manti, and uh -huh. it's Manta. Oh, yeah, uh -huh. see, and Marona and Prohawk, Viche, you guys are used yeah. to us. Come on now. But we do yeah. want to apologize for those those personal names. So um, the city of the city leaders realized it was time to computerize all of the old handwritten cemetery cards, as well as double check their accuracy. It was more work than can, than Tammy could do on a part time basis. So they created a new position. The job came with full insurance benefits, and it was a blessing to us. I was still on scholarship and progressing through BYU's journalism program. I was offered the assistant city editor position at the Daily Universe beginning fall semester 1991, and suddenly Tammy and I felt rich. We were eating out a lot, going to concerts, buying whole boxes of symphony candy bars at Sam's Club, and so on. Life was great. I was just enjoying in the now, living in the now. For once, I put the future out of my mind. I had an adorable, loving wife. We both had good jobs and we were having a lot of fun. Then came the announcement I've been hoping to postpone for another year or two. Tammy said, I feel it's time we start our family. Are you sure? I asked, shouldn't we wait until I have a solid job? I feel our ch children are ready to come. She said firmly, and I knew not to argue. We soon had a child on the way. Fast forward a few months later to my BYU graduation, Tammy was due in a month, and I was still worried how everything was going to work out. She told me she had prayed about it, and she was going to quit her job when the baby was born. She was confident I would find a job to support the family. I should have trusted her. She doesn't have dreams or visions, but when the Spirit confirms something to her, I pay attention. So Garth was born in late May, and we loved our new little son. The copy editor job at the Ogden Standard Examiner materialized within a month and we moved to Weber County. As I outlined in an earlier post, the new job had a few pros and cons. Tammy and I were getting along fine, but Garth was actually turning into a wild child. 
he would get into the kitchen cupboards and dump everything out, particularly syrup. Uh oh. He was also a master climber. If he saw Tammy put cookies in the cupboard above the fridge, he'd find a way to get them when she wasn't looking. And this next part, this is interesting. After one particularly challenging day, I went to the Ogden Temple to pray and contemplate my family's future. I was blessed to receive a special vision where I was shown our children many years down the road. The kids seemed to be in their early 20s to late teens, and they were wearing church clothes. It seemed to be a special event. Hmm. Uh, I watched them interact with each other from about 10 feet away. I recognized Garth, and he still had lighter hair. He was talking to a taller young man with brown hair. There were also two girls in the dream. The older one had dark short hair, and she was smiling at a girl with blonde hair. The four kids talked among themselves for a moment, and then a brown-haired boy in his early teens came skipping into the room saying, don't forget about me, don't forget about me. He called that a dream. It normally says visions. Mm -hmm. um, I thought it was interesting he called that a dream. And what, what was interesting to me is what he's describing here would be about the age they are now. Um, so, anyways. Uh, he joined the four others and smiled in my direction. This boy was the exact image of our son, Mark, right down to the mischievous smile. I knew I was seeing the five children that Tammy and I would raise. It was neat to see their hair color and even their personalities. I went home and told Tammy about the vision. It brought pe great peace of mind to us that Garth might someday behave. A few years later, we were living in Springville again. I had taken the cemetery sexton job, and Tammy was eight months along with our fourth child, Leah. I got an urgent call one morning at work that Tammy felt something was wrong. Her mom, Phyllis, was ta taking her to Payson Hospital, and I should meet her there. When I arrived, Tammy was in a hospital gown waiting for her doctor to see her. She was laying on a bed and explained how she felt something pop deep inside her. As we talked, she suddenly started bleeding heavily and it turned into a frantic situation. I gave her a quick priesthood blessing. Then the nurses rushed her into an operating room. Phyllis and I got out of the way and then waited anxiously. I snuck down the hall and peered through the room's small window. All I could see was the top of Tammy's head as several nurses and two doctors surrounded her. I was scared, but I also felt it wasn't Tammy's time to die. Within a couple of minutes, Leah was born via emergency C-section about four weeks early. She was a tiny little thing, but she rebounded quickly and as soon and soon was the same size as other children her age. Needless to say, the doctor told us that Tammy was done having kids. He had had to slice through her stomach muscles to save Leah and combined with other factors, he advised her against ever getting pregnant again. At the time, I was just relieved Tammy and Leah were okay, but lingering in the back of my mind was the sing-song sing song chant of Don't Forget About Me. He goes on to say, I didn't press the issue, but Tammy hadn't forgot about the vision either. We had some serious concerns, especially after Leah's traumatic birth, but we also had faith the Lord would watch over her. Tammy became pregnant in the summer of 1999, and thankfully there were few complications. Mark was born in March of 2000. It strengthened our testimony to see how each child fit into that vision, and we knew that our family was now complete. That vision was so implanted on my mind that it has been a little eerie to see the kids become the people I had seen. However, I had never seen all five kids together at once like I had in the vision. When Garth departed on his mission to Oklahoma in 2011, Mark was still a small boy. Then Emma left on her mission to Tennessee before Garth returned. With the lowering of mission ages, Seth was getting ready to leave on his mission in June before Emma got home. It looked like we'd have a stretch of nearly six years without having all five children home at the same time. I began to wonder if the dream was simply symbolic. Then we received word that Emma had contracted a serious illness on her mission and needed to return home a few months early. We picked her up at the airport in December of 2013, and she was pale and deathly ill. It took her several months to recover. Meanwhile, Seth had received his mission call to Virginia. The night that Seth was set apart as a missionary, the five kids all put on mission badges and posed together. As I watched them, I got emotional realizing the day had finally arrived I'd seen in my vision. I was so grateful Mark had not been forgotten. 
Yeah, so that ends that blog post. There's actually a picture of the kids uh, that I'll post on social media um, that he's referring to in this blog. So it says, in my next post, I will delve into something interesting, some of the interesting ex experiences I had while working as a cemetery sexton. So September 7th, 2015, Chad blogs, Eddie and the Ghost Boy. I thought it would be fitting to have my 13th blog entry be tied to a couple of cemetery experiences. I basically served two five-year terms as a cemetery sexton. I worked for Springville City from 1995 to 2000 before moving on to other jobs. Then I was Spanish Forks sexton from 2009 to 2013 before returning to Springville for a year. I don't, I don't think I'll ever return. It's a challenging profession, both physically and emotionally. Also, my daily life was pretty much in the hands of the local mortuaries. If a funeral was scheduled for Saturday, I worked Saturday. If I planned to attend a special event, it was almost guaranteed someone would pass away and the funeral would be scheduled at the same time. I could sometimes get a coworker to cover for me, but often it felt like the Grim Reaper was checking our family's calendar and doing his best to disrupt our plans. So at this point in the post, he had a picture of Bill and Ted posing with the grim reaper i think they're they had a bill and ted go to hell movie so that was the picture he had on the blog and it said i did like many aspects of the job i enjoyed the friendships with my coworkers and helping visitors locate their relatives graves but my sensitivity to the other side of the veil worked against me as the years passed the cumulative experiences began to weigh me down i guess the phrase emotional baggage is a fair description of what i was dealing with each day at work, I would add another pebble to my invisible emotional backpack. The backpack just got too heavy, and after about five years and leaving the Sexton job was the only way I could shake off the baggage. So now it's time to feature our two paid sponsors for this week. What's the first one? And now it's time to talk about Everly Well. Summer days mean longer days, better outdoor activities, and more ways to get healthier, including checking in on your health and wellness. With Everly Well, you can take action today by taking one of their at-home lab tests or by adding their vitamins and supplements into your daily routine. So Everly Well is digital health care designed for you. I actually got my test results in today on my food sensitivity test. Uh, I didn't have a high reactivity to any food, but I had a mild reactivity to five different things. Cow's milk, chicken, egg white, rye, and wheat. Uh, I've enjoyed looking into the details of my results, and the results were sent in an easy-to-read format, and there were tips to follow based on the results. So I look forward to talking that over with my doctor. Yeah, that's awesome. So our listeners can do this, too. Here's how it works. Everly Well ships products straight to you with everything needed in one package. To take your at-home test, simply collect your sample and use the included prepaid shipping label to mail your test back to a certified lab. Your physician-reviewed results get sent to your phone or device in just days. Yeah, it's all so simple and easy to use. And for listeners of the show, Everly Well is offering a special discount of 20% off an at-home lab test at everlywell.com slash world. That's everlywell.com slash what the world for 20% off your next at home lab test. Everlywell.com slash what the world. Fruit Loop, second ad. Let's do it. Our next partner has a product that I use every day. I started taking AG1 because I wanted to start focusing on bettering my overall health. Along with that, Athletic Green supports better sleep quality and recovery and supports mental clarity and alertness. I've been using AG1 over the past few weeks, and I'm glad I have. It's a small micro habit um, with big benefits. It's one thing you can do every single day to take better care of yourself. And it costs less than $3 a day, and it's an amazing investment for your health. So that's right. You're truly investing in an all-in-one nutritional insurance my health routine means a lot to me, and AG1 has become a partner in my healthy choices. I feel that by taking AG1, I'm choosing a better me and an overall better health. This special blend of 75 fantastic ingredients supports your gut health, your nervous system, your immune system, your energy, recovery, focus, and aging. 
Right now, it's time to reclaim your health and arm your immune system with convenient daily nutrition. It's just one scoop and a cup of water every day. That's it. No need for a million different pills and supplements to look out for your health. To make it easy, Athletic Greens is going to give you a free one-year supply of immune-supporting vitamin D and five free travel packs with your first purchase. All you have to do is visit athleticgreens.com slash what the world. Again, that is athleticgreens.com slash what the world to take ownership over your health and pick up the ultimate daily nutritional insurance. All right. So back so, to it. Yeah. Jumping back to it. Uh, so Chad uh, continues to say sad funerals would obviously add extra pebble but I also sensed other situations such as when a mother would come the night before and cry on her son's grave, that energy still radiated the next morning. It wasn't necessarily a dark energy, but the grief the mother felt was still weigh me down. I did have some encounters with spirits. Sometimes a deceased person stays here on earth rather than moving into a heavenly realm. There were times earthbound spirits followed me around for a few days and a couple of them stayed for almost a year. I avoided acknowledging them because if I did, my day basically turned into an episode of Ghost Whisper. The most tangible ghostly experience I had as Sexton occurred after we buried a man named Eddie, who had been known in town as a petty thief. His burial spot wasn't far from my office, and almost immediately after his funeral, I saw weird things happening. The first thing I noticed was the window in the women's restroom would be cracked open about two inches each morning when I'd come to work even though I'd locked the restroom door and latched the window. When I arrived the next day, the gate was open to the enclosure where we kept the backhoe and dump truck. This was unusual because I always checked that lock when I left in the evening. It's possible I'd accidentally left the gate open the first time, but after it happened three times that week, I strongly suspected Eddie was still picking locks despite being dead. As I left work after the third incident, I tucked a piece of plastic around the lock in a certain way so I could tell if someone touched it. I drove to the cemetery that night at 9 o'clock to check the lock. It was fastened securely just as I had left it. As you can guess by now, when I arrived early the next morning, the lock was undone. The plastic was still in place, but somehow the gate had been pushed open a few inches. I wasn't very amused by this ghostly prankster. The biggest surprise came moments later when I checked the shed next to my office. The shed had a padlock that required a key, but not only was the shed unlocked, but the padlock itself was hooked on a peg above the door. By this point, I wasn't scared. I was mad. I figured Eddie, can you see him out there fighting a ghost? <laughs> I figured Eddie was nearby, probably pleased I'd noticed his handiwork. So I turned around and said, hey, Eddie, listen to me. I'm impressed with your skills, but you're going to get me in trouble. What if someone sees the open gate and steals the backhoe? I'd get fired. I paused for a few seconds, then added, Eddie, you don't belong here. There's a better place for you. Look around. Go towards the light. Don't come back. He must have listened because I didn't have any problems with the locks after that. When I retired as a Springville Sexton in 2000, I complied several interesting cemetery facts and stories into a book entitled One Foot in the Grave, The Strange But True Experiences of a Cemetery Sexton. It's hard, hardly a literary classic, but there are some humorous and informative chapters in it. I tried to make it as lighthearted as possible. It's available on Amazon and in Kindle form. And can I just add, they still are, by the way. I thought that was they were going to yeah. take those off. There was a big push to have them taken off, but I don't think they ever did. I think maybe you have to be convicted. I don't know. I'll have to find out. Yeah, uh, most days at the cemetery for my coworkers are fairly mundane, but every once in a while we had some ghostly experiences. I want to share a unique situation where I didn't see anything, but my two coworkers did. I'll call them Darren and Sam to protect their privacy. They've told the story many times, but it's been a few years and maybe they're tired of talking about it. We were filling a grave in a part of the cemetery where many original settlers were buried. Once the vault was in the ground, I got in the backhoe and drove the backhoe to, to our dirt pile a few hundred yards away. When I returned with a scoop of dirt, I saw Darren and Sam both backing away from the grave. Sam was pointing at something, and Darren actually hid behind Sam. At that point, the backhoe was close enough that they turned to look at me. Something had clearly spooked them. I dumped the dirt in the grave, then turned off the machine and hopped out. 
The other two started shoveling the dirt as if nothing had happened. But when then Sam asked me, did you see him too? What do you mean, I asked. They looked at each other in surprise. Sam stammered for a moment before walking to a spot about 10 feet from the grave. There was a boy standing right here, Sam said. He was watching us. Darren said, yeah, he was probably eight years old and about four feet tall. He had on some clothes like from the Great Depression, but he vanished when you got closer with the backhoe. A chill went up my spine as he said that, as he said that, and I felt a little freaked out as well. Could you see through him, I asked. They both shook their heads. I thought he was a real kid at first, Darren said. He had dark hair, but his skin looked kind of gray. He stood there for at least 30 seconds. He actually looked kind of mad, Sam added. I was glad he disappeared when you drove back over here. We discussed that boy many times during the rest of the summer. The interesting thing to me is that both Darren and Sam, Sam saw him. I checked the cemetery records, and there was three young boys buried in that area who died in the 1930s. So maybe the, one of them just wanted to stop by and see how things were going. In upcoming posts, I'll share examples of how scenes related to my novels came into my mind. Many of these visions occurred when I was weed-eating around headstones. I often snapped out of the vision to find myself still holding the weed eater a few feet from where I last remembered standing. Too bad never, no one ever caught me on video. I'm sure it would be entertaining to watch. Before I share those visions, though, in my next blog, I'll explain why my family and I now live in Rexburg, Idaho, after living in Utah most of our lives. So we're going to jump to when they... You know, honestly, I would be interested in reading a Sexton's book, just not Chad's. Uh, yeah. <laughs> just just not his, but like yeah. somebody who, you know, yeah. Like a doodle. Yeah. All right. So we're going to September 9th, 2015, following the path to Idaho. We kind of touched on this earlier, but this is the full blog post. We talked about um, this actually in the timeline when Chad and Tammy moved to Rexburg, but September 11th, 2015. Oh, I'm sorry. No, we're not. Um, my bad. So that blog post kind of skipped over because it just regurgitated what we said about hearing the voices at the gas pump and all that nonsense. So the next blog post, September 11th, 2015, a messenger in the temple. He gives this backstory. It's really long of his grandfather, Guy Chestnut. That's who his middle name comes from. And it tells how his grand, grandfather and grandmother were visited by an ancestor while visiting the temple. And that ancestor had asked if they had done their genealogy. He said he had not. So the spirit God got at his grandpa to someone who could help. Chad said he was a teenager when his grandpa first told him this experience. And it really had an impact. Up to that point, I figured only the prophet or apostles could receive visits from messengers but I realized it could happen to common members of the church under the right circumstances. So he tells that his grandfather served as bishop in other capacities in his ward. Yeah, and that was kind of a quick blog. It it was long, but really it, it kind of went around in circles just to get to the point that his grandpa, this comes in later um, mm -hmm. in another blog post. So, so, so September 14, 2015, Chad blogs Paving the Way to Paradise. Chad tells how this book, one of his personal favorites, and was the final book he published at Cedar Fort before establishing Spring Creek Books in 2004. The main characters are Josh Brown and Kim Marler, who end up playing important roles in my Standing in Holy Places series. It's an enjoyable family history mystery that takes place on both sides of the veil. The book itself came about due to some unusual circumstances. He said, Tommy, Tommy, he said, Tammy's mom and grandma had worked on their family lines for years, but there wasn't a lot of family records to work from. Chad found a family history library not far from his job at the Ogden Standard Examiner. He went there and Suddenly, the spine of a small volume wedged between two thick books seemed to triple in size for a few seconds. Then it went back to normal that caught his attention. He stole that from Harry Potter. I know, right? I pulled it off the shelf and read the title, Osborne County, Kansas Cemeteries. I opened it and found the names and death dates of people Tammy and I had discovered in the U.S. Census records the previous year. These ancestors were buried in this rural Kansas county I'd never heard of. 
I made photocopies of several of the pages and took them home to Tammy. We began working on those family lines. And go ahead. Well, yeah. So if you remember in a previous blog, he told of uh, Rachel Marler who helped him join. He helped join her family in paradise. And she also came to Tammy's grandma. Yeah. had the picture. The grandma said, that's who came to me. So yeah. that's just kind of where that tied in. So he says, Grandma Lucille passed away in 2005 and our family history efforts ebbed as we got busy with the book company and raising our family. Then in 2011, I felt an urgency to begin working on the Marler family again. And it was amazing how the dead ends we faced earlier were now cleared away. But tra <laughs> listen, here we go again. But Tammy struggled to get motivated about it. She had found a new hobby, Frontierville, a spinoff a spin -off of the online computer game Farmville. She was spending a few hours each day building fin fictional online towns. I, would hope, I was hoping she would soon get bored with it. I went to the temple that month and received a strong prompting to tell Tammy she needed to stop playing Frontierville cold turkey. I did as I had been prompted, and we had a good discussion about it. Tammy knew the game had become an addiction, but she didn't fully stop. She didn't resume working on family history, history either. Two much later, on September 23rd, 2011, I was working on the Marler line and found the records of several families while Tammy and the kids were visiting her parents. I could feel the spirit strongly. Then I felt the presence standing behind my right shoulder, and into my mind came Grandma Lucille's voice. It was a younger voice than when I had known her, but it was definitely her. You can't do this alone, Lucille said. It's time for those who have stewardship to get off their butts. <laughs> <laughs> she explained that she was going <laughs> dude i'm sorry she explained that she was working in the spirit world as a missionary and she added that as the only deceased member in her family line who had been a member of the lds church on earth she had added responsibility to prompt her descendants to do the temple work i felt lucille motion towards the osborne county book on the desk she said there are thousands of spirits waiting to move to paradise but they're stuck in spirit prison until their temple work is done why don't you pick up there fruit loop so most of the people in that book have accepted the gospel and are waiting for our family to do their work that book is the key it was compiled by inspiration many years ago all the families in there are interconnected through direct bloodlines and marriage I was then shown in my mind a ball similar to the one that drops in Times Square on New Year's Eve. The ball was made up of hundreds of interconnected pieces of glass. I understood that each family is comparable to a piece of glass. Each one is needed to make the ball complete. Lucille then continued, We've explained to these ancestors that their work will eventually be done, but it's frustrating to them that the information is right here being ignored. They feel spiritually starved. They know there's a big feast waiting for them, but they can't cross the gulf into paradise yet. Then her voice got louder and angrier. Uh, this was the Lucille that I remembered. She said, my descendants are letting Satan lull them to sleep with technology. Two months ago in the temple, I told you to have Tammy quit her, the D word there, computer game, cold turkey, so she would be receptive to a message from me, but she didn't. She was more, more important work. She has more important work to do than play games. We need her desperately. She then gave me several instructions to tell Tammy, including that she needed to get her mother Phyllis involved in doing the work. I quickly opened up a Word document on the computer and typed in everything she was telling me. I felt Lucille's presence linger until I finished. Then she said, go tell them right now. It's not your job to do our family's work. You've got books to write. Well, that's convenient, ain't it? Telling Tammy uh, to quit yeah. playing Frontierville, you can still write your books. Yeah. Lord so, have mercy. Do you think this is a good place to stop? Let's finish this blog entry. Oh, where are we at? Oh, uh, okay. right there. So that was a wake-up call for me as well. I finished the Standing in Holy Places <clears> series <throat> that summer, but I didn't have anything new in mind. But I started an outline for my new Times of Turmoil series later that week. Anyway, I printed off Lucille's message and called Tammy to come home. I had her read through the message, and she took it pretty well. Then we went to visit Tammy's parents. I'd never really told my in-laws very much about my spiritual gifts, so it was going to be a curious conversation. They were watching TV in the living room, and I asked them to turn it off. Then I held up the paper and said, Phyllis, your mom, Lucille, just visited me. She had a few things to say. Phyllis read it, and she and Tammy both started crying, but in a good way. They agreed that Lucille's use of the D word was the true sign they needed. Then Phyllis sat 
straight up and said, you know what? Today is her birthday. Maybe this was her gift to herself. We all got chills as that sunk in. Lucille's message worked. Tammy quit playing Frontier Ville, and she and Phyllis have done a monumental work over the past four years. Thousands of names have been submitted to the temple, and I know these people are moving into paradise. Every September 23rd, I wait for another visit, but so far, Lucille's been quiet. She must be happy with what Tammy and Phyllis are doing. Her birthday is fast approaching, though. We'll see what happens this year. In my next post, I'll share some behind-the-scenes stories that shaped my Standing in Holy Places series. So we're going to leave off here. And the episode for tomorrow, we are going to have only one more blog post this brief. Then we're getting back into this timeline, guys. So, um, yeah. So we will see you tomorrow and hope you have a good rest of your evening.